Hello, this is not a review, but a recap and an attempt to explain the wacky, tacky, magical, spastic story contained in the Dirk Gently universe. I will give my thoughts, kind of like a little review I guess, at the end of this video. Obvious spoilers for the first two seasons. So this season was not as complicated as the last, that's because there's no flippin' time travel in this season. And as you know, if you have seen my time travel videos, time travel is nearly always broken and entirely messy. So season two of Dirk Genitals should be easier to fathom, however, there is a lot going on in this season. And so this video will be a little bit longer than the one I made about season one, probably. I don't know. Let's find out. Just like in season one, there are three main stories taking place here in season two. Actually, there's kind of four, but it's not as clear cut as they all intertwine at different times and with lots of little subplots woven in and a shit ton of character development as well. And as usual, towards the end, they will all kind of link up together in a cool way. Holistics, baby! Plot number one, the Wendermore universe and story arc. So season two starts off with a child narrator telling a part of a story of Wendermore and and we get a big old scenescape of this bizarre world. The narrator tells of an evil mage whose army is destroying everything in its path and who is now marching towards the Valley of Inglenook, where a war between two families is taking place. Here we are introduced to two important characters and one little side character who I won't talk about, this big dude. Panto Trost, the Lord Prince from the pink-haired Trost family, the greatest scissor swordsman in Wendermore, and Silas Dendermore, the Prince of the Dendermore family. They are star-crossed lovers from two enemy families. Sound familiar? Hmm? The two families are at war because the Dendermores believe that the Trosts have kidnapped or killed the little brother of Silas, Farson. We later learn that this is not the case and that Farson just ran away, but paranoia and fear has won once again led to war, but Silas and Panto are desperately trying to stop the family feud as the mage, a much more powerful enemy, and his armies are coming to kill them all. Kind of like in Game of Thrones, like the Seven Kingdoms need to stop fighting each other and team up in order to stop the greater enemy, the White Walkers, but only a few people really get this and the big idiots in charge never listen. This is similar to the feud in Wendermore, but there are only three factions in this case. The Dendermore family, the Tross family, and the mage and his magical army. Silas tries to convince Panto to go back with him and help smooth things things over with his mother, the Queen. Panto says the only thing that can save them is the prophecy, as in fulfilling the prophecy. And no surprise, the prophecy says that Dirk Gently is the one who will end the war, so Panto sets off to find him. Windermore is full of wild and magical things, including weird little imp ladies and cute forest people, but more on that later. Plot number two, Project Blackwing and the Magical Powerful People arc. Here we catch up with Dirk, who was captured at the end of season one, and we see he is a prisoner of Project Blackwing once again, which is being led by by this big dumb idiot from season one, Sergeant Hugo Fredkin. I don't know how to say his name. He's a total moron who has no idea what he's doing and seems to have free reign to do whatever he wants, which basically means it's him trying to get Dirk and the other Project Blackwing subjects to use their powers. We assume that Project Blackwing is trying to weaponize or take advantage of the gifted people's abilities, or at least figure out what they are exactly. We don't really know the actual motives of Blackwing other than capture all the magical people, but to what end? Security? Weapons? Who knows? The problem is that Friedkin is so unfathomably stupid and preposterously stubborn, which means he is going about it all the wrong way. And and getting nowhere. This has been going on for two months now, 63 days to be precise, so we know that season two is set roughly two months or so after season one and that Friedkin has gotten nowhere with the subjects despite having done 197 tests on Dirk. At the very beginning, Dirk has a go at Friedkin and is like, dude, they did this to me as a child for years, nothing has come of it, so why are you doing it again now? I'm not psychic, I don't find things or cases, they come to me. This is what holistic means, a nice little reminder for us the audience as well. But due to Friedkin's idiocy, he keeps going on with it anyway. What a dick. During this plot, we will be introduced to a new baddie, Mr. Priest, played by the very much loved Alan Tudyk. He is a former Blackwing contractor hired to bring in the Blackwing subjects. He is credited in capturing 30 of the 42 original Blackwing subjects, including Dirk Gently, the Rowdy Three, and Bart Curlish back in the day. Capturing Bart gave him a serious badass reputation. He is also a violent psychopath, and a heavily redacted document about him contained the words child and beheading. <sighs> Anyway, we also see the rise of Ken and his transition to the dark side. But more on that later. Also, Dirk very early on escapes with the help of another Blackwing subject, the beautiful shape-shifting Mona Wilder. Mona is the one that sets the whole season in motion by giving Dirk his new case, to find the boy. Dirk then teleports out of the Blackwing facility and meets back up with Todd and Farah. But more on that in a bit. Plot number three, Amanda and her visions. Straight up, we see that out of the Rowdy Three, only Amanda and Vogel remain at large. How adorable is 
Nicholas Vogel, by the way. Aww. We assume the rest of the Rowdy Three have been captured. Amanda is getting better at controlling her pararibulitis, which is cool for her, but also kind of not cool, as whenever she has an attack, the Rowdy Three get a nice feed of emotions, but this also triggers her vision power, which she is trying to use now in order to find her friends. So Vogel is trying to freak her out to trigger a pararibulitis attack, which will then in turn trigger a vision so that they can track down the rest of the three. In this arc, Amanda ends up in Wendimore in the Sacred Forest, home of Wakti Wapnasi and the Bafuki Napu. Watki Wapnasi is a forest witch, a powerful seer who helped Panto get to the world of Bergsburg. Bergsburg being the small town in Montana where we meet Hobbs, Tina, Susie Borton, and uh, but more of that in a bit. When Amanda meets Wakti Wapnasi, Wakti helps Amanda better understand her powers and teaches her how to harness and utilize her vision powers. In Wendemore, Amanda's powers are heightened and a little bit different, and so her paravibulitis is actually a good thing here, but more on that in a bit. Plot number four, Bergsburg, the mage and the witch. Here we get Todd and Farah who are still on the run and are on the FBI's most wanted list. Actually, they are on a lot of lists as Farah's brother expositionally states. Todd is trying to dirk it up by shooting massive holistic wads all over the place and Farah is pandering but not really supporting as she is convinced that Todd doesn't have dirk-like powers. They are trying to find Blackwing where Todd is convinced they can rescue Dirk who will fix everything. They end up in Bergsburg, Montana, a small town where they meet the goofy Sheriff Hobbs and the hilarious Deputy Tina. They end up teaming up to solve the upcoming mysteries. More on that in a bit. In this plot arc, we also meet the mage from Wendemore. The mage somehow is running about the real world, or our universe, causing all kinds of trouble and associating with very nefarious characters. We find out about his dealings and motives later. We also meet his soon-to-be apprentice in the form of Susie Borton, a regular working-class small-town woman with a broken home and a crippling injury. Early on, she witnesses the mage killing her shitty boss. Later, the mage's earth-based henchmen show up and are about to kill Susie when all of a sudden Bart, who was on a mission to find Ken, shows up and kills them all and then has a bit of a mental breakdown as she is struggling to figure out who she is in relation to the cosmos. She starts screaming at the universe and this freaks Susie out, who then grabs a magic wand and blasts Bart unconscious. This leaves Susie with the Mage's magical wand and spellbook. She then runs away. More on this in a bit. Whew. So that's what I believe to be the four main plot points driving this season. I've grouped them together as best I can, so now I'll go into finer detail about how they all connect together. Let's start by bloody breaking down Wendemore, how it came about, what the hell it actually is, and its fate. Wendemore is a magical land that has existed for three generations, since 1967 to be precise. So it is a fairly new world, it is an alternate dimension that was created by an anomalous entity, the official terminology for the Blackwing subjects. Basically people with magical powers. Project Molarch, the old in the coma was Wendy Moore's creator. So in order to understand Wendy Moore, we, we first need to understand uh, the boy or Project Malark. In the 1950s, an infant boy arrived on a boat, the infant male Pollock Francis, now known as the Bergsburg Boat. The boat mysteriously dropped out of the sky and into a field. A local couple, Marina and Hector Cardenas, with their one son Arnold, found the boy and took him in. But that was no ordinary boy. It turns out that the boy actually has godlike reality warping powers that activate when he's asleep. When he sleeps, he can alter reality and bring things into being, both inanimate and animate. Basically, his dreams would come true, but in a bad, scary way, not a beautiful, inspiring way. So here we see some pocket dimensions that he has created. Big flying monsters, the purple people eater, the cool air gun, and so on. All the ruckus, though, drew the attention of a secret government agency, the predecessor to Blackwing called Project Black Book. This caused much stress to the Cadenas family, who were already arguing over whether or not they should sell their farm to the Kellum Corporation, a big business looking to buy up some land. Side note, the mage is actually called Mage Kellum, and his army in Wendemore are called the Kellum Knights. But more on that in a bit. So the stress finally got to the family, and behind her husband, back, Marina Cadena sold the farm to the Kellum Corporation. They get into a huge fight and Marina ends up killing her husband with a pair of scissors. The boy, witnessing the murder, freaks out and enters a dream state. This launched his surrogate mother into the sky and zaps his father into a tree and sends the murder weapon into a pocket dimension. Hence we get the man in the tree and the dead body in the car and these, these weird bloody scissors. This left only his brother Arnold and him. Arnold, after losing both his parents, is traumatized. So he calls the number the government agency had previously given them and turned in the boy. So if you remember this old man, you know, Braytac from Stargate, he is Arnold, the brother of the boy, and he never forgave himself for turning over his brother to Project at the time, Black Book. So when the agents came to take away the boy back in the day, the stress of it caused him to use his powers on a scale unlike ever before. He turns his fantasy, his imaginary world, into reality. He creates Wendell 
Wendermore. Wendermore is a child's fantasy world main rule, constructed from his imagination but incorporating things from his life, such as the scissor swords, because his mum used scissors to kill his dad, and the Kellum Corporation being the bad guys trying to take the land and so on, but also, like, it's actually real. Not just a fantasy land anymore, the boy's powers were so strong that he created another dimension, an entire alternate universe, with living, breathing creatures and magical forest people and lovers and weird moons and all that shit. It's now all real. After Dirk gives his patent pending case closed final statement, Silas says, All of us here, we are just figments of a scared child's mind. A reality crushing realization, perhaps. But Dirk rightly corrects him by saying, No, you are real people with real lives. The boy's waking dream was like the big bang that created this universe. The sheer power of that creation caused an energy burst that threw the boy into a coma, which left this world, Wendermore, to slowly fall into chaos. Without its rightful ruler, which it has done and will continue to do until the boy is returned here, meaning Wendermore. So where did the boy come from? We don't exactly know, and we don't really need to. We might learn this later on, we might not, but we will certainly learn more about this weird world that is Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency as the series continues. I love the mystery and the intrigue of this show. Once the boy created Wendermore, he fell into a coma which he has been in ever since. The boy was given the code name Project Molark. So how did Dirk escape Blackwing? We learned that Project Molark, the boy, recently suffered a stroke. This caused a thinning between the two universes, our universe and Wendermore. This is when Mona was contacted by the funny little snail voice in her ear. The voice told her that she needed Dirk to find her friend, the boy. The voice said if she let Mona use her eyes, she would put people where they need to be. The voice was Wakti Wapnasi in Wendermore, whose powers are not dissimilar to Amanda's powers. She can see and gleam information from the cosmos, and with the thinning of the walls between the two universes, she was able to send psychic message between the two worlds. She knew they needed the boy to come back to Wendermore to make things right again. To do this, she contacted Mona, who used her shape-shifting to find Dirk, who was then teleported by Wakti Wapnasi out of Blackwing so that she, he could use his holistic powers to find the boy and make things right. <laughs> A lot of shit happens along the way, but it all ends up nice and good in the end. Hurrah! Hurrah for Dirk! What about Supervisor Fredkin and Ken's rise to the dark side? Ken got captured by Blackwing and is being held at the facility. Fredkin has been put in charge of the facility, which is a bit strange because he is such a fucking moron. Here we learn of other projects, cause old Blabbermouth here starts prattling away to Ken. We also learn more about Blackwing, like how Blackwing was created to capture the subjects with special abilities known as the anomalous entities. And we also hear about a few other former Blackwing subjects, like the human bomb, the invisible guy, or the shapeshifter, which is Mona Wilder. So I don't know if we're gonna see them in the future or not but it's interesting that they're slowly feeding us this information but why is ken locked up in his cap he's not a magical dude project alpha which turns out to be ken rapunzel the corgi and <laughs> this taxi supposedly was captured by blackwing and locked away in the facility they are trying to find out what his power is ken tries to explain that he's just a normal dude who knows a lot about computers but they don't believe him because he survived seven days with bartzana Bart Curlish. How could this be possible, they say, as she is an invincible, ruthless killing machine, yet somehow Ken survived and therefore he must have powers, right? He doesn't, as we already know. Over time, Ken starts to lend aid to Friedkin and eventually ends up kind of running the show. Ken slowly turns bad, but for what reason? Well, he's been traumatized quite a bit by both the Blackwing subjects, mainly Bart always threatening to kill him, and also watching her slaughter countless people without reservation, but he's also been subject to 70 days of torture by Blackwing as well, so he's probably not thinking straight and would be rightly a little pissed off. But also I think he legitimately thinks the anomalous entities need to be captured and secured for the betterment and security of the nation. He was also kind of a bad guy when we first meet him, don't forget, in season 1. Illegal hacking and bank robbing or whatever, so it's not that odd for him to turn even more bad after all that's happened since then. Also, due to his own stupidity, Friedman gave Ken top level security clearance, making him essentially his equal in authority. And because Ken is actually good at his job, people seem to look the other way and the higher ups recognize his intelligence and potential. But more on that in a bit. <sighs> We're getting there. Okay, so the mage has been traveling to and from Wendemore and obtaining weapons from our universe to use in his battle back home. He is equipping his army with modern superior firepower, but why does the mage want to kill everyone? A power grab? He wants total control? Well, yeah. And, uh, no. He's a creation from a child's mind, so he is simply a one-dimensional character. He is evil for the sake of evil. He is driven to conquer and instinctively gets off on killing. Why? Just cause. A child is incapable of making super deep characters with ulterior motives. He created a fairy tale villain, an evil person who is just evil for the sake of being evil. So Susie ends up with the wand and starts to fix things she thinks are wrong in her life. At first we feel sorry for her because she appears to be the victim, but as the story progresses we learn that she has always been a total bitch. 
bitch and deep down quite the monster. She is the reason her life is shit but she is so fucking deluded she blames everyone else. When she gets this powerful life changing wand she takes advantage of its power. Her and the mage switch places. The mage doesn't care about Wendemore. Deep down he's always known that something was a little off and he doesn't understand why he is so hell bent on conquering it. So he decides to move to the real world with obvious plans to take it over. Susie pissed off with her crappy little life decides to move to Wendemore to become its ruler. So they switch spots. Farah and the crazy Tina end up turning the mage into a crispy barbecue. Montana style, baby. I, I don't really know what accent they, they do in Montana, nor, nor would, could I do one if I did. Anyway, when Dirk and the gang eventually return the boy to Wendemore, the all-powerful reality creator banishes Susie to the eternal prison, the train in the sky, and uses his power to return Wendemore to its former glory, and they all live happily ever after. This might not be the last we see of Wendemore though, because Ken is convinced that Blackwing still has the portal in the farmhouse, which they, they may well do, and he says it is concrete proof of the supernatural. So, Amanda and the Rowdy Three. They get reunited and Amanda learns more about her powers. She is able to bring people to and from different dimensions and see behind the curtains of the very cosmos itself. Amanda's powers are mostly dormant, but they are super duper powerful, and we should expect to see a ton more of that in the future. We, we learn that the Rowdy Three are actually life force vampires. Ugh, best band name ever. So we learn that these guys feed off not just emotional energy, but actually the life force, or soul, for lack of a better word, and can actually drain a person to death. If they have just a little snack, the host should recover, but they are powerful enough to completely drain a human and leave them dead. If they go too long without feeding, they will die, it seems. At the end of the season, Amanda tells Todd that she saw things in her visions. Something big is coming. Reality is falling apart at the seams, dude. There is more people out there like Dirk. Someone has to find them before Blackwing does, and that's where the road is taking me. I'm a leaf on the stream of creation. One really insane scene is where Todd and Amanda combine their powers to keep the portal between the two worlds open. This allows for Dirk to sneak back into Blackwing and rescue the boy to return him to Wendemore, as is the prophecy. But keeping the portal open is extremely painful, so Amanda takes them out of their bodies. Their minds end up in a strange space-like dimension. Todd asks, what is this place? To which Amanda replies, I guess it's what is behind everything. It's like the backstage of reality. I've seen this in my visions before. It was trippy as fuck, and I can't wait for this series to expand on this. Okay, almost done. So during the siege on Blackwing from the Kellum Knights, then controlled by Susie, Friedkin has a revelation and realizes that he is possibly the bad guy, but is just too stupid to realize it. Dirk talks him down, and Friedkin turns kind of good, and Friedkin helps them out. He ends up getting mortally stabbed by one of the former mages, now Susie's henchman, and Ken tosses him into the portal just as it is closing. This somehow how lands Friedkin in the weird behind the reality place. He's all healed up, which is nice, and he has a, a quite a nice moment of clarity, stating, Oh, now I get it. Even though this guy has been a total dick, I really like him. I, I don't know, you kind of end up feeling sorry for him, and he's, he's so adorable at times. I'm glad he's still around. Though now that he is gone, Ken, a far more intelligent and capable person, ends up in charge of Blackwing. At least he is the supervisor for now, the role formerly belonging to Friedkin. So what happens to Bart? Bart ends up slaughtering a fucking shit ton of baddies in Wendemore, which would have been nice to see just to satisfy my violence addiction, but it wasn't necessary, so that's, it's fine. The boy sends Bart back to the real world, and she requests to be sent back to Blackwing. She is lost, she is confused and irritated by the world out there, and she also feels guilt, believing to be constantly causing problems and stuffing things up. Bart oddly feels more comfortable locked away in Blackwing than running around in the real world. Kinda sad. We like Bart. Ken is on a power trip and now has Mr. Priest as his evil right-hand man. Black wing just got real. Todd and Amanda end up best buddies again, but have to go their separate ways. Aww. The universe has different plans for them. Amanda ends up with the magical wand, and her, Beast, who is now stunning, and the Rowdy Three hit the road. Dirk, Todd, and Farah find themselves a base of operations and set up their detective agency, and Todd reveals that he kept the magical air gun. Dirk states that because some of the stuff from Wendemore ended up in our world, this will likely have big ramifications in the future, but they all end up happy chappies with a fresh start for them in Season 3, which is not yet being confirmed. So that pretty much sums it up. I've probably missed a few things here and there, but that's that's pretty much the main things that took place, I think, in this series. That's probably what most people are going to be talking about anyway. So season three has not yet been confirmed. Although this show is being received well critically, it's not getting that many hits. So if you like this show, which you should, because it, it's just, it's well, you know, you don't have to like it. But it is very fresh, it's different, it's totally fucking out there, and it's just, we haven't seen stuff like this before. So please tell everyone to watch it, share it around. It's fun, it's different. And it's different. It's just, that's what it is. It's, it's 
it's so different from the usual trash on TV that we have seen time and time again. This is completely out there. It's complicated. It's super weird. It's kind of like a kid's show in the sense of how wacky and silly it is, except that it clearly isn't as it's far too complicated and so fucking violent. Like the opening scene of season two is this super goofy world of Wendemore and pink haired knight who use scissors to fight with and it's all like, well, this is for kids. Then Pento just cuts a dude's fingers off. It's so fucking brutal. And it's also super complicated and fascinating. They have set up this amazing cosmic world that I can't wait to see expanded. The cast are all great, and the character development is sensational. These guys are fully fleshed out, complex yet relatable people. Bad guys gone good, good guys gone bad, confused people, stoners, rockers, killers, dorks, cuties, adorable monsters and hilarious punks, and villains like one dimensional all the way through to four dimensional villains. This show has some of the best characters around. What do you like best about this show? Let me know how you feel, I am legitimately interested.